Chamber of Law, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law at Chicago Kent College of Law and Director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States, ISCOTUS. And I'm here with my colleague, who I'll ask to introduce himself. I'm Hank Parrott. I'm a Professor of Law and former Dean at Chicago Kent College of Law. And Hank, is, you're going to talk with us today about one of the challenges to the Affordable Care Act that doesn't actually have anything to do with the individual mandate. That's right. It has to do with uh, the spending clause of the United States Constitution. Well, what part of the statute uh, is being challenged here? The part that requires the states to expand coverage of the Medicaid program. The Medicaid program is the program that provides health care to poor people. And the part that's being challenged requires the states to expand the program if they're to continue to receive the substantial amount of federal funding that they already get for the existing Medicaid program. So the, the Medicaid program as it stands now is funded in part by the federal government and in part by the states? That's right. Uh, so, and this, who would have to pay for this expansion? Well, the, the statute says that the federal government will pay for the expansion. The states challenge that. They claim that the additional federal payments that are promised uh, are woefully underestimated, that it actually, the expansion actually will cost a lot more. And does the federal contribution diminish over time? It does. Initially, the federal government pays 100% of the estimated costs of the expansion. That number goes down to um, so that the states have to contribute 5% by 2017, and by 2020, the states will have to contribute 10% of the uh, additional costs. So the states are unhappy that the federal government is telling them that they're going to have to spend some money. Well, the, the states are unhappy that the federal government's telling them what to do. So can you explain what the constitutional challenge here is? Sure. Uh, the spending clause of the United States Constitution is found in Article I, which is the part of the Constitution that specifies the limited powers of the legislative branch, the United States Congress. And in Section 8 of Article I, Clause 1, uh, the Constitution says the Congress shall have power to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Now, of course, on its face, that doesn't uh, use the word spending, it doesn't use the word clause, and it doesn't say anything about the federal government imposing new obligations on states. But here's the reasoning that makes this language uh, pertinent to the controversy that the Supreme Court will resolve. To pay a debt of the United States might arise from a contract that the United States government has entered into with someone, anyone, but it could be a contract between the federal government and the states. And like any contract, uh, there's value that flows both ways. And so in spending clause cases, what has happened is the United States Congress has appropriated money that can go to the states to support programs. And contractually, the federal government has insisted that the states meet certain obligations in order to receive this money. That's exactly what's going on under the Affordable Health Care Act with respect to the Medicaid program. So the states can choose not to participate. Exactly. Uh, and the federal government does not have the power just to say you must participate. Well, they don't have the power under the spending clause anyway to say you must participate. So what is unusual here? It sounds like what's going on here is exactly what you just described that's legitimate under the spending clause. Well, in some respects, there's nothing unusual going on. The federal government does this all the time. It does it with respect to funding for uh, highway construction. It does it with respect to mass transportation. Uh, it does it with respect to uh, public schools and colleges. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of programs in which the federal government makes money available uh, on certain conditions conditions that the states must fulfill in order to get the money. What makes this unusual is, first of all, the federal government has said uh, not only we'll take away or we won't make available the new money that is available to cover the costs of this expansion, but we're going to take away all of your Medicaid money unless you agree to expand coverage in the ways the statute uh, provides. So the impact on the states is uh, a greater portion of the overall uh, federal funding 
for the program. And not only that, federal support for Medicaid is a huge proportion of most states' budgets, uh, 25 to 40 percent in some cases. Uh, and so that uh, has the states uh, particularly up in arms about this. And in addition to that, the states say that health care, and more particularly health care insurance, is a traditional sovereign concern of the states, not the federal government. And therefore, these restrictions in the Affordable Care Act uh, impact uh, core issues of state sovereignty more than some of these other programs do. So how does the spending clause and doctrine that's risen up around it uh, help the states in making these arguments? Well, the Supreme Court has recognized some limitations on the conditions that can be imposed on receipt of federal money. Uh, and this is, these limitations have come to be known uh, as the coercion doctrine. Four of them are quite traditional. Uh, one of them is that the power to impose restrictions uh, can only be exercised in pursuit of the general welfare. The second is that the conditions on receipt of funds have to be related to the general purpose of the particular program. Um, third, the limitations, the restrictions on the states have to be clear enough so that the state freely can choose whether or not to participate in the program. And fourth, uh, fairly obviously, the conditions can't require that the states do something that otherwise would be unconstitutional. Um, now, those are not really the conditions that are at issue in this case. What is at issue in this case is a fifth limitation, which says somewhat more generally and vaguely that uh, restrictions on receipt of federal money can't go so directly and so harmfully at core aspects of state sovereignty. Because under the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, uh, we have a federal system. And just in case someone missed that in reading the other parts of the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment uh, makes it clear that the federal government is not entitled to encroach on areas of traditional state sovereignty. But the states could, again, could say we're going to take our sovereignty back by not participating in this program. Exactly right. And the lower federal courts, uh, in addition to the to the case that we're talking about right now, but the, there are several dozen cases in the lower federal courts involving the so-called coercion doctrine as a, as a part of the spending clause. And without exception, uh, they have uh, rejected almost all of the cases that claim that the federal government was overstepping its bounds under the coercion doctrine. And typically, some of the most recent of these cases have said, of course the states have a choice. They always have a choice because states have taxing power. And therefore, if the states uh, don't want to fulfill these conditions of the, of the Medicaid program, these new conditions for the Medicaid program, they can turn down the Medicaid money. And who cares if it's 40% of their budget? They can uh, impose additional taxes on their citizens to raise, to raise the 40%, and they'll be in the same position. And, and so what are the states arguing here in the Supreme Court? What makes this different, do they say? Well, they're, they're arguing that this is different because of the, <clears throat> of the magnitude of Medicaid uh, federal funding to the state budgets. Uh, they're arguing that this is different because the federal government threatens to take away not just the new Medicaid money to fund these, these new requirements, but it threatens to take away all of the Medicaid money. Now, the federal government responds to that argument by saying that uh, the statute doesn't mandate that all the Medicaid money gets taken away. It simply gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services discretion to decide how much of the Medicaid money should be withdrawn for a state that doesn't um, fulfill the, the mandate to, to uh, expand coverage. So perhaps there might not be as big an impact on the state budgets as they as they fear. That's right. Uh, now, the states say that, they, that the statute itself does not uh, guarantee them that only a certain amount will be taken away, that it opens up the possibility that everything will be taken away. And they, they also make much of the fact that, this, uh, that these new restrictions, these, these mandated expansions in the Medicaid program, uh, impact an area where the states traditionally have had special sovereign competence. Uh, there's a federal statute, indeed, called the McCarran-Ferguson Act that says that uh, insurance will be regulated by the states and not by the federal government. 
Um, and uh, the states say that this violates that long-standing allocation of power only to the states. So if the states were to win in this, in this case, uh, are there implications for other types of federal programs? Oh, absolutely. I think there would be quite a lot of excitement if the states win. Uh, I think that will call into question whether uh, the conditions imposed um, on receipt of uh, federal highway funds uh, can be sustained. Uh, it will raise questions about whether conditions imposed on receipt of federal mass transportation funds can uh, be sustained. Likewise, with respect to the conditions including uh, gender discrimination conditions uh, for receipt of federal funding by uh, higher education programs under Title IX of the Civil Rights Act, uh, more general conditions imposed on any program that receives federal funds under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, at least when those funds are received by states. So I think an awful lot of uh, federal programs, federal restrictions that are taken for granted by most people now will be called into question. That doesn't mean they'll all be invalidated. It just means there'll be a lot of uncertainty um, and a lot of litigation for a while. Hank, is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish? Well, I think the, the interesting thing is to speculate about the implications if the government wins this. Um, and one is tempted to say that, that the coercion doctrine would become a nullity if the government wins. That's almost right, but it's not completely right because we would still have those four traditional restrictions, including the one that says that whatever restrictions the government uh, imposes uh, for receipt of federal funds have to be related to the purpose of the particular program that's being funded, and I think that's a significant restriction going forward. Um, thank you very much, Hank. Thank you. It was fun.